Introduction and foreword of News from No Man's Land. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Wales. Introduction and foreword of News from No Man's Land by James Green. Introduction i am indebted to the rev james green for the privilege of writing an introduction to his book in which he gives a lucid and interesting description of the life of our gallant soldiers of the a i f in his capacity as one of our chaplains to the force all of whom have done such noble work during the war he has been able to enjoy a close personal touch with our men more particularly perhaps at gallipoli the record of his sympathetic observation and experience will i am sure be heartily welcomed by all who are interested in the welfare of the a i f previous publications have i know chronicled the incidents of our campaign in egypt and on the gallipoli peninsula deeds in which the greatest courage determination and self-sacrifice have been displayed by our men from the southern seas many of whom alas have made the supreme sacrifice in the cause of justice and freedom chaplain green's work will however be an interesting sequel in that he describes what one may call our second phase of operations on the western front here in france our australian troops have continued to show that magnificent bravery and spirit which has enabled them to undergo cheerfully the severest hardships and even to enhance their fine reputation as soldiers which now stands second to none in this huge army no words of mine can adequately express my admiration and affection for them i am proud to think that for nearly three years now i have been privileged to serve with them during which period they have made traditions which will live for all time in the history of australia i wish all success to chaplain green in the publication of this book w r birdwood france may thirteenth nineteen seventeen forward for reasons known to the men of the australian imperial force i am always interested in meeting others who wear the green badge on their arm a good soldier is always as proud of the colours he wears on his shoulder as the colours he wears on his breast he knows that each brigade and battalion possesses a soul of its own and he is proud to belong to this battalion and to worthily wear its colours for these reasons i ask the privilege of dedicating this book to the officers and men of the first and the fourteenth brigades sister brigades they are from the mother state with them i campaigned and for them i have a proud affection heroes of many a fight for those two brigades will stand out specially in australian history the story of the landing at anzac the battle of the lone pine Pozieres, Fromel, La Pomme, and Balcour. Some of the men drafted from the first to the fourteenth shared in the perils of Gallipoli, and all are associated with the fighting on the Western Front. For them all, I wish that they may fight on to the certain and glorious victory, and have the luck to return to Australia, the land of sunshine and opportunity, there to help in building up the Commonwealth in harmony with the principles of freedom for which they are fighting in spite of necessary suppression or vagueness of names of localities my comrades of the fifty fifth battalion to which i was attached will recognize many of the incidents described and i can only hope that reading what the padre has to say may cheer them in some lonely places or help them to be happy though miserable in some indifferent billets James Green. End of Introduction and Forward. Chapter 1 of News from No Man's Land by James Green. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 1 A Quiet Night on the Western Front. We marched along, the sun was high, we marched along, the halt was nigh we marched along a little parched it seemed we marched and marched and marched we sang a song a little dry we sang a song 
a halt was nigh the whistle blew ah a welcomed cry halt welcomed rest from wearied road with opened tunic laid down load ah welcomed rest with opened vest twere worth that strain to rest again h h v cross london rifle brigade a route march in northern france nineteen sixteen we are getting near it at last we have started our march through the quaint flemish villages past canals where long strings of barges painted grey and bearing the marks of the wonderful army service corps of the british army are being towed steadily forward occasionally we march through good french towns with their fine churches and cathedrals we hated the pave it is hard for marching but we recognize that it is a great advantage to possess such hard roads to bear the enormous war traffic of great guns and heavy motor lorries proceeding constantly to the front our band cheers us up we are proud of it the tunes we like best are advance australia fair australia will be there and bonnie dundee the women and children and a few old men come out to cheer and clap and occasionally we see some woman in black turn aside to weep is she thinking of some brave husband or son who marched to the front just as gaily as we are doing and who did not come back but what rouses the enthusiasm of those stricken people is the marseillaise when our band strikes up the martial strains of that most wonderful melody the old men square their shoulders and the boys march bravely alongside us and the whole roadside seems to be vibrant with the fighting spirit i remember one little fellow with a crutch who though a confirmed cripple hobbled in front of our band for miles it was a sight which made us forget that we were footsore and hungry away behind us are the memories of the long train journey from ismalia to alexandria only a vague recollection remains of our small fleet of transports sailing the beautiful waters of the mediterranean we do sometimes think of the reception we got as we seemed into marseilles with its statue of notre dame guarding the seas from her eminence on the hill above then the long troop trains and longer journey across la belle france a beautiful country worth fighting for is the verdict of many a stalwart australian from out back and from perhaps some little bush township but with a church a blacksmith's shop and a hotel further out of course there was a race course and divided by miles there were the stations and farms but it was a land of magnificent distances here however there is intensive cultivation and towns close to each other a pleasant land of beautiful trees and rivers and grass of greenness new to us but we are getting closer to the desolation of war closer to the valley of decision by and by we rest in a small village and it is sunday the church bells are ringing and as i have made elaborate arrangements for church parades i am looking forward to a good padre's day the brigadier however cancels everything sorry padre the men are going to be gassed this morning but not by you they are and they look very uncanny manoeuvring there in the fields with gas helmets on no one is harmed by the gas and they learn that it is possible to live and move under gas but i am sure they would have preferred my gas for once i am billeted with a very nice family here and as the daughter is quite charming i have many visits from the younger officers i did not know i was so popular with them mademoiselle has learnt to speak english quite well don't you like australians best of all said lieutenant gallant with a languishing look to mademoiselle we have many good soldiers here english they do not say much scotch a very good men they speak more and ask if there is any place where they can buy whisky i like them all and i do like australians best the gallant lieutenant beams with joy but she continues archly because i always like those best who come last now the battalion is formed up to march my batman says to mademoiselle you are very sorry we are going aren't you oh but yes and one could see it was real sorrow 
i know why i ventured to say it is sunday and to-day you would have worn your beautiful dress ah oh, oui she says sadly you are very wise and it is true come and she leads us into the house again opens the wardrobe and behold the costume from paris très chic the lovely hat a creation the high-heeled boots they are there quite innocently she tells us that had we stayed she with many another fair one would have made promenade oh what we have missed and what greater pleasure they have missed who would have made promenade to the big church and along the quaint streets of that beautiful village we have seen them working in the fields on the railway in the signal boxes but the brave women of this village would have liked us to see another side of their life when in their parisian costumes they promenaded the streets with the grace which seems natural to every frenchwoman we have had the deep sound of the big guns in our ears for days now and we are getting so near that we have seen fights in the air our band instruments have been packed away and we are in our last billet before going in it is afternoon the day following the whole brigade is on the move in readiness to fight the men march in file under the avenues of poplar trees the points where the various companies enter the sector have all been detailed and officers who have been down to the sector before act as guides at a crossroad the colonel on his horse watches the men break off for their different directions and receives reports from time to time nevertheless in the darkness the transport which i am temporarily with goes too far and we have to halt for instructions by this time our guns are booming out we don't know whether there is some stunt on or whether they are merely firing to cover our changing over some thousands of men are coming out and going in it is a difficult operation the noise of shell fire is great and now we can see the festoons of flares going up in the hun lines the lieutenant has inquired and he says we are right and must go on i don't believe it i have been down the road and i saw a parapet i wish i had not come with the transport they are so visible on the white road at any time we may be discovered and a machine gun turned on to us the horses are getting restive the doctor has kindly lent me his horse and it is jumping about i seem so high up and exposed there in the saddle and yet i cannot hold the beast when i dismount the wagons, too, make such a distinct noise as they rumble over the metal road. I agree with one of the men, whom I hear declaring to a chum, that the whole bally thing is no bon. The men inquire when a fresh gunshock is heard. Is that ours or theirs? With a brave optimism, I assure them that all the guns in action are ours. They take me for a veteran and say, It's all right, the padre says they all are ours most of the men who have been in action before add to their authority by agreeing with me but i have a shrewd suspicion that like me they think they are ours and i know they hope they are all ours with a splendid audacity and tone of finality reminiscent of my cricket umpiring days i continue coolly to announce to every inquirer oh yes of course that's one of ours at last a shell breaks on the road with a vicious whiz bang no one is hurt thank god but it was close and the horses are playing up amid the silence which follows one of our australians cries out now then padre what about that is that one of ours such a question and at such a time demands a moment's thought but i answer quite confidently yes that's ours now everybody laughs but it relieves the tension it is relieved more by the fact that the lieutenant realizing that we have gone too far has given the orders to about turn and we are getting the horses and wagons behind the bend of the road more inquiries i've lost my faith in the transport the doctor's groom has come for the restless rosinante and i'm free if i am to get to the battalion headquarters i must proceed on my own but first i will turn into this little shelter a forsaken dugout covered with stout beams and sandbags two of us light up our pipes but a profane sentry draws near 
now then you blighters put out those pipes you mustn't show the huns a light don't you know you're in a very dangerous place it's all dangerous but we didn't know that this place was specially dangerous i must make some inquiries of my own i would have to leave the transport some time why not now i get into a long communication sap like many another on the western front it is called watling street but it gives me a cue i remember now that it leads into convent avenue and that i heard them say leads into plug street and that is the road to the battalion headquarters i pull my tin hat firmly down and when the banks are low i crouch for the machine-gun bullets are whistling overhead and all the choir and orchestra of the guns on both sides are in full voice now the concert of europe has by a metallic crescendo reached its fortissimo the full diapason is out but as always in war the vox humana is silent there are little islands traverses in the communication trench and suddenly emerging from the sap near one of these i nearly bump into a sturdy machine gunner i know well he is a member of my church a sweet singer in my choir when he is at home and this is the night for the choir practice too i see it now as in a vision the choir is gathered round the great organ and the conductor wraps out his admonitions with a baton they are practising one of my favourite anthems send out thy light you must duck your head here padre it is a bad place and you are not supposed to loiter but i must wait i am asking myself are these guns sending out the light and truth yes they are i say to myself it is a quick mental process but i am satisfied with the conclusion we crouch down together and talk of the old church he gives me more information and i press on again i am talking to myself a bad sign but the meeting and the memory has stirred up emotions not to be stilled we must have two anthems next sunday i say to the conductor as though he were present first send out thy light and second the radiant morn i wonder if after this fury there will be a radiant morn for europe not one that has passed away when wilt thou save the people o god of mercy when not kings alone but nations not thrones and crowns but men flowers of thy heart o god are they let them not pass like weeds away their heritage a sunless day god save the people a few more turns of the sap and then i come to three trenches meeting and it is a dangerous spot for shells are dropping close but the sentry with bayonet fixed is on guard oh, hot place here yes padre you can plop one any time here i keep to the left side as much as possible under the bank you're wise and what are you here for men of the fifty-fifth are to be directed down this sap to the front line and men of the fifty-fourth go down that and by this you can find your way to the battalion headquarters eureka i found it bonsoir and bon chance sonny my present troubles are over arriving at the battalion headquarters i find it to be a farmhouse ruined beyond recognition as such kindly nature has covered it with a screen of verdure rendering it almost invisible the cook is there and his assistant my kit has not come down to trolley line yet but the major who has been in some days shows me my dugout a mere hole hours after the officers begin to turn up after various adventures they seem surprised to see me in first our padre is the limit says the colonel chuck him into the centre of darkest africa and he would strike out for home they glare at me with vengeful jealousy but they have to confess i got supper on the way with the help of the cook hot coffee melts them it is professional jealousy i tell them we ought to have a few non-combatants to settle this war we're good pals after all and i know they would not care for a padre who got lost worst still they wouldn't want one who didn't go in with them at all there's nothing like sticking up to these fine young fellows now and again mutual admiration tempered by strong opinions on irrelevant questions the colonel is jubilant because our battalion is right in now without a casualty others both going in and getting out 
have unfortunately not been so lucky beds made at last fritz is still letting off fireworks now to get to my dugout i walk quietly to the left behind a wall of sandbags then going through an opening i run smartly for the hole for machine gun bullets are splitting the air I have a bag in front of my dugout and a sheet of corrugated iron to keep in the light. All night long the guns boom, but you sleep all the same. When we get our papers up a day afterwards, we read of this particular night a neutral paragraph headed, A Quiet Night on the Western Front. End of chapter 1 Chapter 2 of News from No Man's Land by James Green this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 2. Notre Dame de Deliverance. From city homes, from county homes we came, from mother's love and father's gift we came. A wind most terrible blew o'er earth's seas. It waved a smoldering ash and blazed up war. The smoke and heat of that great hell drew us, and from our lives we came to live to live from sluggish routine sluggish wrong we came from heedless walks from aging rust we came we called it life twas not we came to live out of the profound profound will come out up out of the deep will come not from the shallows h h v cross london rifle brigade a young soldier's de profundis at the gate of a ruined farm in our sector in flanders is a little chapel to our lady of deliverance it is seventy years old the brickwork at one corner is broken down by shell-fire but the ancient picture above the altar and the altar also are intact what was the idea of the ancient proprietor in building this chapel at his gate for most of the wayside sanctuaries hereabout are dedicated to our saviour it was a large farmhouse, evidently the property of some wealthy farmer. It must have survived the Franco-German War of 1870, but it has not survived this, for the huge grange is a mass of ruins. Perhaps the shrine is a recognition of deliverance during the First War. Although it stands amid ruin today, the chapel is prophetic of a deliverance which is in process of being worked out. Near it there is a battery of field guns, and in rear of it a battery of heavies. In fact, all around there are guns, guns, and more guns. They are hurling an avalanche of shells into the Hun lines when I passed on a Sunday afternoon to conduct a service at a post in the second line. What a horror of sound! The Huns began to reply, and they sent nothing over but high explosives. Crump, crump, crump! went the shells as they exploded, raising clouds of dust and smoke, but fortunately missing all our batteries. To be comparatively safe, it was necessary for me to go by a way which avoided all the targets the German gunners were aiming at. As though despairing of getting our guns, the Germans began to belabor our trenches with menenwerfers, and soon the crash of mortars began to mingle with the noise of our howitzers, field guns, and machine guns. Thank God it did not last long. In ten minutes' intense bombardment in a large sector like this, hundreds of projectiles are launched in the air but we had the last word in this duel, and when it died down we were not alone. A flight of our aeroplanes droned overhead. They were going over for the usual afternoon strafe. There is some danger to pedestrians from fragments of anti-aeroplane shells, for the Germans ceaselessly bombard our planes, usually without any luck. They go right over the German lines, probably carrying bombs for some depot or ammunition dump when they have passed a different a solitary aeroplane appears the flight was of battle planes this one is for spotting purposes and a single battery begins to fire in its direction the intense bombardment therefore gives place to a deliberate slow firing of shell after shell in obedience to the observer above they are trying to get some special object and registering their shots for future guidance 
at night time this little sanctuary of our lady of deliverance becomes the centre of a scene which might be taken from some drama of the underworld huge ammunition motor lorries dash past with a reverberation which makes the ruined walls tremble they are delivering stores of shell largely made by the women of england for the daily consumption of the guns our lady of deliverance has many disciples among both english and french women in these days daughters of deliverance we might call them then very often at night time the gun positions are changed and by immense efforts great howitzers are hauled into new pits the army service corps must deliver its goods also by the light of the moon and from the front glide past the motor ambulances with wounded and sick they are protected by a mesh of expanded steel for they go right into the zone of fire in this way deliverance is worked out for unhappy flanders amid thunderous roar of cannon the rising and falling of star shells rockets and flares of all colours and meanings and the ceaseless rattle of machine guns our lady of deliverance is thrusting forth the flail of retribution and the banner of freedom it is no sacrilege to ascribe our slow and sure pressure on the enemy to higher and divine powers even if we acknowledge for our sins that the backward sweep of the awful flail smites us also this would be the last thought to the inhabitants of these war-stricken areas to begin with they are a deeply religious people and their religion gives them hope and faith for the future the germans have destroyed their church but not their faith they have removed the altar from the ruins of their once beautiful church to a neighbouring farmhouse and there they pray to notre dame de deliverance the same spirit is seen in the neighbouring towns and villages in such churches as are left standing you usually see the union jack and the tricolore at each side of the chancel and always the statue of saint jean d'arc is prominent decorated sometimes illuminated and ever the object of many devotions it is this spirit which possesses the women of france yet religion here to-day manifests itself in masculine types and even the maid of orleans is portrayed in the garb of a soldier and with a drawn sword it is the effigy of christ which is usually seen in wayside sanctuaries and they are not usually dedicated to notre dame this is natural enough in such a virile country as northern france the women however are doing their share in working out the deliverance near this very sanctuary you may see women and girls on the top of the haystacks building them up a soldier on leave is usually seen tossing the stooks up and boys drive the big flemish horses in the lumbering old-fashioned wains but all the rest is the work of the women even to harrowing the fields the harvest is being got in right up to the guns and the soldiers are not allowed to harm crops or traverse fields the heavy traffic on roads by guns and army transport has necessitated a good deal of reconstruction the boys and the old men are doing it how the women can stay on and attend to the little shops in the villages at the front is a mystery to us for these shops and houses are being steadily demolished by gunfire during one of our heavy bombardments recently i went into a little shop to make a small purchase the building alongside had been shelled the previous week and had to be abandoned the girl behind the counter was obviously nervous and she said to me in broken english too much bombardment i do not like tout anglais i replied immediately she brightened up wonderfully très bon pour les allemands she said and went about her work singing a curious note amid this quaint flemish environment of red brick and tiles interspersed with trees and grass of a greenness unknown to australia is produced by the london motor buses they rush past with a roar filled with tommy singing keep the home fires burning from one end of the line to the other every man has his job there are snipers machine gunners trench mortar men bombers signalers pigeon men this last suggests the pigeon service men who know pigeons are chosen for this work and they like it 
in the stress and strain of battle wireless and wire may break down so pigeons are trained by a daily service of duplicate messages they have their regular flights and there is a constant service of cages being brought up to the lines by motorbike and flights of pigeons returning to their lots at stated times we see the german birds flying back too so that man beast and bird have all been drawn into this great war they get very wise too and the older pigeons fly low along the hedges and by the avenues of poplar trees to avoid gunfire the pigeon man follows the commander into battle as well as the telephonist but most useful and enthusiastic of all are the observers o pip observers post is a place the enemy is always seeking to discover and knock out but they are cleverly hidden the other day however one of our men fell by his enthusiasm he was directing gunfire on an enemy battery and by and by he got it when the hun gun position was hit he forgot for a moment how precarious a foothold he had in his eyrie in the spreading branches of a tree we've got it he cried standing up and waving his hands he fell out of his perch and broke his leg he is now rejoicing in a hospital we must not forget the wonderful work of the miners they drive tunnels and construct weird bomb proofs and other works thus contributing their share to the coming deliverance in which everybody in the front line believes yes that little chapel is a parable and a prophecy itself intact amid the ruins it reminds us that although we ourselves are imperfect instruments our cause is good and the day is surely coming when these farmhouses and churches will be rebuilt in this beautiful countryside and prosperity and peace will rule every gunshot expresses our faith and what we suffer in the price we pay for freedom and security which shall be ours and for many long years our children's in the quiet days they brought their offering of flowers to this shrine Today we bring our howitzers drawn by huge traction engines our field guns our mortars our machine guns our rifles and these are our offerings more from distant lands many thousands of miles across the ocean men have come nay they have been sent they have been given up by their women for they are husbands fathers sons and brothers these men greater than they know themselves to be are the living offerings at this shrine given to the cause of notre dame de deliverance end of chapter two chapter three of news from no man's land by james green this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter three news from no man's land there's a zone wild and lone none claim none own that goes by the name of no man's land its frontiers are bastioned and wired and mined the rank grass shudders and shakes in the wind and never a roof nor a tree you find in no man's land they that gave lives so brave have found a grave in the haggard fields of no man's land by the foeman's reddened parapet they lie with never a headstone set but their dauntless souls march forward yet in no man's land h de b major fifth division b e f france no man's land is that bit of ground six hundred yards and sometimes only thirty yards between our trenches and those of the enemy over this disputed area we strafe each other night and day there are often water holes even swamps in no man's land and both sides have a habit of draining trenches into it wild flowers and even garden flowers grow in this area for it contains ruined farmhouses and orchards poppies red as blood lilies white as snow roses and blue cornflowers are often seen there waving in the breeze sometimes swaying before the hail of bullets from machine guns the birds sing oblivious of war here and sometimes you see pigeons trying to fly across i say trying because our men always endeavor and sometimes succeed in shooting them why 
because probably they are carrying spies messages to the huns which may mean death to us we do not want the enemy to know how we are distributing our batteries in the rear so we try to stop enemy aeroplanes or pigeons crossing either way as soon as daylight appears you will usually hear the droning of a swarm of great bees humming their way across no man's land they are british aeroplanes often flown by young men from eighteen years of age and upwards they never refuse a fight and the best proof of their efficiency is seen in the fact that fortunes are wasted by the germans every day in anti-aeroplane fire in the vain hope of stopping them they often cross in ordered ranks and go through wonderful evolutions on their way circling over each other like catherine wheels and looping the loop as if in the joy of battle and contempt of the enemy our airmen are the pride of the infantry if you want to be cheered up all you have to do is to look up and watch these adventurers of the air many a stirring fight have we witnessed in the air over that unowned terrain called no man's land one evening we watched a fearless observer making his regular circles amid such intense anti-aeroplane fire that we trembled for him by and by he began to fall and we watched his descent with our hearts in our mouths when we saw that he was going to land just in our lines we raced madly to the spot some of the officers revolver in hand thinking they might need to fend off the enemy were so eager that they forgot their tin hats which were really more necessary to make sure of him the boches simply plastered the spot where he had landed with shell fire arriving we saw him desperately dragging the engine which was intact under a parapet then he took refuge and we congratulated him saying he was very lucky lucky do you call it he responded why they've ruined my machine why so they had there was a legend with us in one sector not far from armentier of an airman whom we called the mad major i don't know whether he was one or two or three like the gun we called beachy bill at gallipoli perhaps there were several of him all we know was that we would see an airman flying gamely among the puffballs of the breaking anti-aeroplane shells of the enemy and sometimes he seemed to get into trouble and we used to cry out they've got him he would fall like a stone recover fall again and then when we looked for the awful end he would skim low over the german trenches plying his machine gun like one o'clock good luck to the mad major there was a method in his madness although we never knew what he was going to do next nor did the hun in spite of danger and orders we used to crouch behind the parapets watching our airmen and it was a tonic to us of course at any time and for long periods all the time shells from spitting rifle batteries to sixty-pound projectiles from big guns in the rear are screaming and hissing over no man's land and wherever you are you never know your luck moral do not despise your tin hat it may be uncomfortable but it would be more uncomfortable to stop one even if it were but a fragment new monsters called tanks have taken to moving across the debatable territory called no man's land spitting out flaming death as they go in short all the accumulating frightfulness which we are learning to use is being used to say to the hun in tongues of fire and steel this is not your land be gone and take up once more your watch on the rhine but you wonder why we do not annex no man's land and advance the strategy of staying here till the right moment comes is wise and humane there are fine towns and villages containing non-combatants on the other side of no man's land it would be but to mock their hopes to advance unless we could sweep on everywhere nor do we wish to conquer in such a way that every village is left in ruins here and there at strategic points we may have to do that it is not so much that we want to break through as that we want the whole line to break meanwhile it is a very hot and unhealthy place for fritz besides that we are beating the enemy every day on this line it suits us we have organized it 
here we have trolley lines concrete bomb-proof stores and many things that take time to build later when the right time comes we shall cross no man's land at many places and it will become france again forever until that time comes we cannot do more than present our claim to no man's land we do this frequently and in person our patrols and scouts enter it nightly and it requires courage and craft to do this through secret sally ports over parapets and where the line has been damaged by shell fire they steal out in the darkness and the german sentries keep a succession of flares and star shells going to detect them what hair-breadth escapes they have and what escapes the hun sentries have for sometimes they find themselves very near to one and they have to get back with their information without raising an alarm if possible sometimes however through a mistake in the fog or darkness they get into the german line and they have to fight and escape amid following bullets at such times our men at the parapets have carefully to cover their return with rifle fire and even help them over or under our defences back again to safety young intelligence officers take many risks as they crawl amid the hollows in no man's land revolver in hand in search of information we got a few body shields for our scouts in our battalion and they went out for a long time with a greater confidence the protection they afforded gave them a calmer frame of mind which produced extra efficiency but we make more serious claims on this disputed ground by our raids which occur in many places every night the raid is a survival or perhaps a revival of the old hand-to-hand -hand fighting it is a curious anticlimax of science in war of which there are so many illustrations to-day in spite of long-range guns of great power and high-velocity telescopic rifles we fight in trenches close together and we have got back to grenadier days hand grenades rifle grenades and trench mortar bombs as big as howitzer shells are tossed over to the enemy lines at the same murderous distances as those at which wellington's and napoleon's veterans fired at each other in peninsula days the raid is the last illustration of our backsliding in an age of science to the primeval fighting instinct unrelieved by the chivalry of a knightly age you may be sure there are no banners flying or trumpets blowing no heraldic challenge to warn the hun that he is to be raided it is a form of frightfulness calculated to jar the nerves of the most militant disciple of the gospel of blood and iron we were warned that our battalion in common with others would be expected to raid the enemy's lines in its turn and volunteers were immediately called for there was no lack of response then the men had to go through a long and careful training as those do who are out to win a country football cup in the rear of the sector they dug trenches which were a replica of those to be raided they did this from photographs provided by our indomitable airmen on this ground the men were trained physically and in the use of the special arms they were to carry relay races to give them speed crawling attacks at night to make them wary and acquaint them with the lie of the land and added to this bayonet fighting revolver practice and all this again and again and in all sorts of light or darkness until at last they were smitten with a desire to get it through and a confidence that they could put it through so much so that two of their number who became due for leave declined it as they thought it was up to them to be in the raid after training for it at last the great day arrived no one knew until almost the last moment when the raiders came up in two london motor buses singing australia will be there we did not know them at first they were a disgrace to the battalion as far as clothing went for they were clad in ragged and dirty clothes from which all marks of identification were absent 
short as the notice was we had organized a banquet for them and even got a huge three-decker bride cake from a neighboring village we had a solid meal of three courses and you may be sure it was none the less hearty because of the absence of intoxicants every one was cheerful but there was an undercurrent of seriousness and grim determination the chaplain had to propose a toast and after he had wished them good luck and god bless you the men came up with apparent casualness to say a word or two of intimate confidence not to be divulged in this sketch then the men were prepared they all wore aprons containing bombs some had rifle and bayonet some clubs entrenching tool handles with cog wheels at the end commonly called chloroform sticks some bombs and revolvers every non-com had a watch set to divisional time and an electric torch amid a good deal of merriment they blackened each other's faces not for fun but because white faces would be easily revealed under the white light of the german flares then the motor lorries came up to take them into the sector and with many cheerful wishes they drove away as jolly as though they were going to a party a motor ambulance followed with the regimental doctor the chaplain and the stretcher bearers down the long communication trenches we followed them silently over the duck boards from which occasionally some would slip partially into the water draining below the arrival at the front line is marked by a fading away of the troops holding it it's me for my dugout i heard one man say it ain't healthy with raiders about this is wise because when the raid begins the boches will rain shells on no man's land and then put a barrage on or about the parapets to get them on the return now the raiders are sorted out and put round the three secret sally ports through which each party will enter the feboten land the doctor inspects the special aid posts to see if all arrangements are perfect yes the bandages and doctor's kit are all laid out and the a m corps men at their posts and i and the doc with an a m c sergeant repair to the main aid post to wait it is three-quarters of an hour yet to zero time but before that many of the raiders will be lying out in no man's land in holes and hollows we try to read a bit then talk and all the time smoke smoking has a curious psychological effect it steadies the nerves makes you believe you are not perturbed but there is no doubt that the time of waiting is always the worst every now and again we look at the watches quarter of an hour to go yes says the doc i expect some of them have crawled out now ten minutes to go you throw down your book it is no good pretending to read for three days our gunners have been wire cutting they have cut the wire over a very wide front but they always take care to cut it where our men are going to attack zero time is nine p m and exactly on the second hell breaks out guns in the rear roar out in fury trench mortars close at hand vomit forth their missiles of death and even machine guns and rifle batteries help to swell the crescendo of battle the ranges are well known and the guns do their work without harming our men who are now crawling forward our aid post is a dugout covered with steel joists and sandbags but it rocks with the swish 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 of the shells flying through the air like hail now the boche begins to reply and every now and then a whiz bang bursts on the parapets we can only hope that no high explosives will happen to break on our dugout now the guns lift and the raiders get closer up a frenzy of flares go up and we are so curious that we sneak out to see across no man's land we cannot see a man of our party and we take that to indicate that the huns too cannot see them yet now it is nine ten and on the instant there is a silence as terrible as was the fearful noise the raiders are among the germans now they rush from dugout to dugout bombing meeting huns they fight face to face and hand to hand german fire breaks out on no man's land and occasionally a rifle shot 
then bad luck to us the hun ceases to engage our guns and he puts his high explosives on and just over our parapets and this is the time we must get out for our work for casualties soon come back indeed a message has come to say that two are back one man who has brought a wounded comrade and himself has suffered a fall injuring the knee as we run along the duck boards behind the parapet we bend low and listen fearfully to the crump 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 of shells exploding behind our line the raiders have just ten minutes for their fighting at that time our guns will raise another curtain of fire behind them to keep the huns from a counter-attack they must not stay under our own fire now they begin to return with their eyes bright with the excitement of battle covered with mud with a german helmet or two with many stories of the fighting and with their wounded the stretcher bearers are out in no man's land seeking others and we have enough to do dealing with those at hand we have got most of them close up to the parapet and the doctor has difficult work to do under circumstances the reverse of helpful for german shells are landing in our lines pretty thickly but when you reach this point in a stunt you cease to think of danger you are absorbed in helping the wounded turn to the padre as a friend and almost as a father they babble of their home folks give you messages and they hold your hand tightly when they are in pain you cannot stay with one longer than is necessary for others ask for you ask the padre to come is something which makes it worth your while to be with the men in battle one man not at all young gives me many loving messages to one whom i took to be his wife i send them all to australia and receive thanks from his mother who explains that her son was a confirmed bachelor another poor chap has a slight wound but it does not bleed and he is so cold we heap blankets and new sandbags on him and give him stimulants but he gets colder and colder and just as the ambulance reaches the billets in the village he dies of shell shock the wounded men are put on the trolleys and the stretcher bearers begin to push them out of the sector and while they do so the huns shells fall all around but who cares that is the feeling you have at this stage now we have a bother some of the raiders are not easily persuaded to start on the homeward march up the communication trench the special officer stands notebook in hand ticking off the names of the raiders who have returned in spite of his assurance some want to go back to find chums who are really not lost others seek excuses because they want to go back for trophies or booty which they now remember to have seen one of our company is still missing and a wounded man tells me where he has seen him as a matter of fact things have quieted down a lot now and we have virtual possession of no man's land the huns have hidden they are satisfied to sprinkle our sector with shells in the hope of getting returning men but our stretcher bearers are indignant at the idea of my attempting to get the lost man securing my information they go into no man's land and find him we still have a number of less seriously wounded men behind the parapets everybody is talking of the exploits of one of them he is an athletic fellow whom the doctor is attending to counterbalance the pain he is suffering i congratulate him and suggest that he will probably get recommended for reward no fear of that he says laughing more likely ten days c b confinement to barracks why i inquire well i shouldn't have been there at all he replies i can't understand that i say well sir i'm not a raider at all but when i heard the shots i couldn't resist so i slipped over the parapet and into it it is difficult to tell exactly what success the raid has had but the men seem to agree that with those they accounted for and huns they found killed by our artillery fire altogether twenty-five of the enemy were destroyed we have lost three killed in action and a number of wounded who will recover one prisoner has been brought back and he seems to be a regular walking orderly room for the number of official documents in his possession it may be but a small affair but when we remember that there were twenty-five raids the same night 
it will be recognized that we are not sitting down tamely and submitting to the german occupation of any part of france probably the british press will announce to-morrow all calm on the western front but we know that every night no man's land is the scene of deeds of valor and self-sacrifice proving that our men have the fighting spirit of their fathers and that apart from the clash of material forces in the great battle of spirits which is the ultimate basis upon which a decision in war depends we need not doubt the will to victory of our men no man's land with all its pathos and sorrow the grave of unknown heroes the battleground on which many a brave exploit is enacted which is unnoticed and unrecognized is still the pledge and prophecy of our final victory now we must trudge back to the village we walk about two miles in saps and then join the ambulances waiting on the road you begin to feel tired at this stage End of chapter 3chapters four and five of news from no man's land by james green this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter four the bomber the call of the bugle the bugles of england were blowing o'er the sea as they had called a thousand years calling now for me they woke me from my dreaming in the dawning of the day the bugles of england and how could i stay the banners of england unfurled across the sea floating out upon the wind were beckoning to me storm rent and battle torn smoke stained and gray the banners of england and how could i stay o oh, england i heard the cry of those who died for thee sounding like an organ voice across the winter sea they lived and died for england and gladly went their way england o oh, england how could i stay private j d burns a i f killed in action gallipoli son of rev blank burns late of barnsdale victoria we had a treasure in our battalion a sergeant who knew all about bombs he liked them and knew exactly how to treat them of course we could not keep such a man in the battalion he was manifestly called to the vocation of instructor for bombing schools they will never make a general of him he is too valuable in his present capacity besides his grammar and pronunciation are not equal to such a strain the more lucid his explanations are the looser is his control of the aspirate although that is nothing in these days for i heard a member of the british parliament speaking the other day and he oh but that is another story bombs is all right if you treat em properly they will never do no arm to you if you don't monkey with them they are gentle and armless things to them that is wise to them he would say addressing his group of humble disciples gather round and i'll learn you about bombs and what time he toyed with the vicious missile the class would gather somewhat fearfully around him when you remove this here pin you release the spring which causes the charge to explode the bomb in the time that you count five so he removes the pin and proceeds to deliberately count one two three now his disciples begin to melt away four oh you needn't worry five there ain't no charge in this one it's empty for experimental purposes he has a wonderful command of hard technical words only equalled by his disregard of the proper pronunciation of simple words now with reassured courage the class gather round again and he takes up a live bomb as you count three you hurl the bomb not with a jerk but with a smooth round arm bowling motion so one two three and he hurls the bomb clear into a trench forty yards away it explodes with a loud detonation smashing up the trench and he resumes his lecture although you have removed the pen you can still keep your bomb right by pressing the spring until you are ready for action so you can have a bomb in your hand just ready for throwing as you go up a german trench you've got to do it just right so that fritz has no time to pick up your bomb and throw it back at you 
you can have faith in your bombs now it's not like them there gallipoli days when we had to fire jam tent bombs made on the premises they was filled with turkish bullets and all sorts of things but they couldn't be relied on to do the same thing every time did you ever hear of lieutenant forshaw v c down cape ellis way he hurled jam tin bombs for forty-two hours at johnny turk he had to light em with his cigarette not been used to smoking cigarettes i'm having been brought up as a schoolmaster the smoking did him a lot of arm for which reason the king made him a v c lucky fellow i call him many's the time i've been short of a fag at once quite a number of the sergeant's pupils present fags and having made a selection and put a few in his pocket for future use the sergeant proceeds there's another man i want to tell you about captain shout v c of the first battalion he was throwing bombs at such close range at the turks that you had to have three lit at once for him and he fired them just so as they would explode among the enemy he kept this up a long time and held the enemy up but one burst too near him and after some time he died of his wounds a great loss to the a i f believe me you needn't worry about such happenings now only one in two thousand of our mills grenades goes wrong and with the odd ones you've got your sporting chance now what about bombs that land close to you sometimes thrown by the enemy and sometimes by accident our own when a man it's the side of the trench don't be too scared even them bombs is harmless properly treated get behind a traverse if there is one if not then you render the live bomb armless gather round i'll show you sitting on a chair he took a bomb and after counting three threw it on the ground not a great way off the men scatter for all their worth but the sergeant having thrown an overcoat over the bomb calmly resumes his seat crash goes the bomb at the fifth second the coat rises with the bomb the fragments drop harmlessly around and the coat is not much worse now then let that learn you to throw sandbags blankets your own overcoat or some such thing over a bomb and ten to one no harm will follow do you ever hear of mulga bill at quinn's post a bomb dropped in the trench amongst them and he properly put a sandbag from the parapet on top of it to make sure he sat on top of the sandbag when it exploded he went up with the bag a little way he came down all right and none the worse but he was narked annoyed to find his chums laughing at him what are you laughing at he said i did that to save you fellows but i'll never do it again that's where mulga bill was wrong he done right except sitting on top of it that was an extra act a sort of curtain raiser at the wrong end of the play let that learn you not to put hard substances on a live bomb it don't take kinder to pressure i'll show you gather round the instructor then proceeds to throw another bomb as counting three he throws the bomb down he proceeds quickly to put a sheet of corrugated iron on it now he cries run like hell and he showed them the example the bomb exploding sends fragments throws the torn iron all around and the men have learnt another strange lesson in regard to the behaviour of bombs notwithstanding the confident handling of bombs by this expert i am privately of opinion that men should beware of the familiarity which breeds contempt in the matter of bombs there was a man in our brigade who had just returned from a bombing school with his head stuffed full of all sorts of knowledge about the manufacture and use of bombs he had a small collection of them and one morning in the shadow of the calvary at the crossroads at fleur bay having an audience he held forth on his new subject illustrating his remarks by fiddling with a small screwdriver at a bomb which he professed to know all about suddenly it exploded wounding him sadly a little learning had for the moment made him mad to get back to our bombing school after the instructor's talk the men in turn would hurl bombs from one trench to another until they were no longer bomb shy as a matter of fact a good bomber is just as good a life in the army as any other expert indeed a man may lose his life through the absence of a bomb or the knowledge of how to use it in the words of our instructor the cure for the bombing craze is a hair of the dog that bit you 
the germans are good bombers and when in their counter-attack they come down a trench throwing bombs the only way is to bomb them back and out again he used to say the boches began this blooming bombing business only his adjectives were sometimes profane what we have to do is to give them a fair sickening of it bomb their zeppelins bomb their submarines bomb their dugouts then in one final outburst he would say bomb the boches and if you don't believe what i say ask the chaplain if they ask me how can i contradict him our bomber often surprised us even to alarm but the biggest surprise he ever gave us was when he had been granted ten days well-deserved leave in blighty he turned up again in six wondering the men who envied him his leave inquired why he had returned before his leave was up well, i was very lonely in london he replied simply i like to be with my pals end of chapter four chapter five of news from no man's land by james green this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter five romance and reality page from a world old palimpsest shrined on the altar of the sea whereon a nation's new-limbed crest glitters in glorious blazonry grave that our race shall kneel anigh for i gallipoli good-bye dying to rank as men with those who manned the wall while ilium burned this is the crown your story knows the need their rare dear madness earned troy's heroes cry to ours and thee gallipoli gallipoli they watched through fierce weeks many a one while from his tent of rose-hued lawn the unclenched fingers of the sun unloosed the westering birds of dawn for them those sunbirds stoop and fly no more gallipoli good-bye god's acre bare and barren woods cross guarded mounds where noon rays burn like pale knights praying by their swords set upright in the bracken fern thy love shall keep our freemen free gallipoli gallipoli j alex allen in the sydney bulletin the army chaplain drawn by mars from his quiet round of parish work and life made up as it is of pastoral visitation educational and devotional meetings and the public services of the sabbath is certain to find active service a restless experience his battles aforetime fierce enough sometimes were in the arena of synod or conference hall and his duels were of the more or less friendly sort of the minister's fraternal now he sees something of battles more dramatic in which the missiles are more than words he moves in an atmosphere of romance mingled with grim reality and he begins to feel that he is living in heroic days he sees the world in process of reconstruction and looks on whilst the fabric of man's life and character is taken down and built up again according to a new pattern our disappointment in not being allowed to proceed straight to the front in france was somewhat mitigated by the news that we were to train and wait beneath the shadow of the mighty pyramids at cairo on the ground where napoleon addressed his troops reminded them that forty centuries looked down upon them and awaited their achievements we trekked through the sand sweated through the hot days and shivered during the cold nights as we camped amid sand which is always either very hot or cold there was a hard winter's work for padres here who desired to do something to counteract the evil attractions of cairo for the troops the reality was however always tinctured with the romantic glamour of egypt and the nile there was vieux cairo the ancient forstad with its undoubted earliest christian church the place to which we can say with almost certainty that joseph and mary came with the infant christ wanderings amid the antiquities of this ancient place full of coptic traditions and an occasional mingling with the multicolored crowds gathering among the bazaars of the monski somewhat relieved the tedium of evolutions amid the eternal sand of the libyan desert 
a hard three days manoeuvring was set over against the interesting fact that we fought our sham battles at shakara the city of the dead and our brigade signalers flashed or flagged their messages from the step pyramid the very oldest building in the world today going down to egypt had the same dangerous fascination for us as for the ancient israelites and padres had to be modern isaiahs warning the men of the languorous seductions which egypt in modern times as in ancient holds out to men of a sturdy race then came the never-to-be-forgotten day when we marched out of our mina camp headed by our bands away from the sand of the desert and on through the crowded streets of cairo singing advance australia fair and good-bye cairo we were going to fight and we were glad we had left the back block townships away beyond sunset for this very purpose to strike a blow for old england that we were going to strike a blow at the heart of the turkish empire made it all the more thrilling whether we would succeed or not we could not tell but we knew that we were going to strike hard no ancient crusaders ever felt higher enthusiasm than did we amid the marshalling of the armada of transports at alexandria then with pompey's pillar looking down upon us we sailed away from the city of alexander the great past the pharos and out to the blue mediterranean whither bound we hardly knew but in those days when padre stood upon the higher decks and spoke to the men in their ranks below in the deep well decks of those huge transports the romance of it all impelled them to call men to high endeavour and heroic faith we had to do censor on this voyage and we found that the men's letters were surcharged in almost equal quantities with reality and romance they complained that they had to sleep on an iron deck eat iron rations and to crown all someone said we are commanded by a general named iron hamilton but they felt the glory of it and displayed the spirit of adventurers with st john's patmos in sight with its white buildings on the summit of the hill we steamed on for lemnos lemnos the island to which in greek myth jove's son was hurled from heaven in disgrace and where the greek army called on its way to the trojan war was beautiful to us after the hot sands of egypt we manoeuvred on shore among the most beautiful wild flowers and we sailed in mudros bay around the formidable battleships of a mighty allied fleet those were romantic days for the padre everything one said was flavoured with the seriousness of last words and final exhortations the last communion service and the last service on the huge flagship of the a i force the meniwashka is something to remember on april eleven the topic was consecration and joshua said unto the people sanctify yourselves for to-morrow the lord will begin to do wonders among you the lesson was the story of the preparation of joshua's army for the crossing of the jordan knowing how desperate was our enterprise we girded ourselves for the attack and whatever the result of our campaign may have been and we shall not know that fully until the war is over we can claim that we obeyed the word which said when ye come to the brink of the water of jordan ye shall stand still in jordan how many of our brave fellows on the brink of the water of the last jordan stood firm on that bit of land we wrested from the turk the last service of all on the deck of the flagship on april eighteenth nineteen fifteen had for its message faith in god's leadership the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night it was a pillar of cloud clouds of battle smoke and a pillar of fire from the thunderous guns of our fleet and although it was not written in the book of fate that we should take gallipoli we may yet believe that god was with us in that address after showing first that god does lead nations and secondly we are not in the war for empire aggrandizement but for the preservation of god-given ideals i turn to ask are we suitable instruments for the fulfilment of god's will i look back with thankfulness to the fact that my last words to the men who were going to land at gallipoli were on personal salvation 
some of you may be satisfied that we are right as a nation in regard to god but you may have confused and troubled thoughts about your own relation to god you say i am not a church member or communicant what about my personal salvation in regard to the forgiveness of sins there is no magic or mystery about it a man can be a christian without knowing the creeds just as a man can be a soldier without knowing the military textbooks the great revelation of the bible is of god as a father think of a good father he would forgive even a prodigal son so will god but there must be repentance if you thus come god will accept you and say thy sins which were many are all forgiven go in peace and sin no more thus you may go forward and fight all your battles knowing that at last when you ground your arms before the throne of god and answer the roll call of eternity you will hear the father say well done thou hast been faithful unto death enter unto life on a brilliant day of mediterranean beauty our ships lifted their anchors and amid resounding cheers one after another steamed out into the aegean sea in the wake of the fabled argonauts and on the ancient track of the greek army sailing for the plains of troy in the darkness battleships and transports took up their allotted positions and in the early dawn there began one of the greatest combined naval and military battles which the world has ever seen even amid the tragedy of those gallipoli days we lived under the spell of the storied past we were living in st paul's world on a certain bright sunday morning we addressed some hundreds of men on paul's vision and call to macedonia we were fairly safe for the shells flew over us on their way to the beach and the hill intervening stopped the rifle fire of the enemy it is a good thing to be on the right side of the hill the men were always glad to hear about that indomitable fighter paul we were able to point to cum Cale in the distance which our battleships had bombarded some days previously it is the ancient troas from which paul sailed and troas again is the more ancient troy he made a straight course to samothrace this would take his little ship something like that greek lugger sailing in our sight over the place where a few days before our good friend h m s triumph was sunk by a submarine and there to the right was samothrace in its snow-capped beauty facing us that was the romance we were in the ancient world the reality was that we were verminous plagued with flies and all the diseases they bring after visiting the dugouts that day i had to bathe in the gulf of saros wash all my clothes and dress in others less worrying try to sleep in my cave of adullam that night experiences solemn and weird were ours on that craggy shore a communion service at that same place stands out in my memory how freely the men came to the table of the lord in the beautiful twilight they sang hymn after hymn as relays of men took their places it was a setting solemn and impressive as any cathedral of man's building for such a service but there was a grim reality about it too for as they sang i fear no foe with thee at hand to bless ills have no weight and tears no bitterness where is death's sting where grave thy victory i triumph still if thou abide with me others who had left the service for duty were passing in single file up the long communication trench armed for the fray it seems a strange and romantic fact that when we returned to egypt after the evacuation of gallipoli our main camp was at tel el kabir sir garnet wolseley's trenches were visible on the outskirts of our camp but what is more interesting is that on the march to the desert front our force followed the line mainly of the sweetwater canal which is probably the route of the israelites under the wise generalship of moses some units took a route through the desert to ismalia there was less romance about their experiences and a reality which does not lend itself to description here crossing the suez canal we campaigned for some months on a route which ultimately brought us to a post seventeen miles out in the desert 
what an opportunity for the padre of retelling the story of the wandering and fighting of the hordes of israel under moses and joshua our arab camel convoys on a new-made road parallel with a strategic railway traversed by electric locomotives east and west together lent an air of romance to this period of service but it was counterbalanced by a severe reality for on occasion we marched at seven a m with the thermometer at a hundred degrees and a padre sunday beginning with the first church parade at five a m and conducting others at various posts among the sand dunes was a day which left one more conscious of reality than romance an atmosphere of romantic interest hangs about our french campaign the scene changes and for the white-robed hosts following saladin or mahomet ali for the bronzed warriors who followed chambises alexander the great ramsay ii for the red and blue arrayed against each other under napoleon or abercrombie we have to exchange the chivalry and battle represented by such names as poissiter crecy or waterloo in our fleet of six transports our division en route had to watch and pray wearing a life-belt always we steamed into a bay of malta on a sunday morning this gave us another memory of paul and we had to speak of his shipwreck and landing there arriving at la belle france we realize that it is a land of chivalry and romance we move under the banner of joan of arc and fight on old battlefields every town has its storied past but this is no war of chivalry and our battalions do not flaunt the banners of heldry the reality is cold mud dripping dugouts and hard fighting night and day and yet over all are crossed flags of the two most romantic and adventurous races in the world the british and the french the achievements both of napoleon and wellington call us the one to the path of glory and the other to the path of duty and a second greater waterloo awaits us as victors in the struggle for the freedom of europe at this time we may still hear the ringing cry of henry v at harfleur in our english ears once more into the breach dear friends once more or close the wall up with our english dead in peace there's nothing so becomes a man as modest stillness and humility but when the blast of war blows in our ears then imitate the action of the tiger stiffen the sinews summon up the blood disguise fair nature with hard favoured rage then lend the eye a terrible aspect let it pry through the portage of the head like the brass cannon let the brow o'erwhelm it as fearfully as doth a gallid rock overhang and jutty his confounded base swilled with the wild and wasteful ocean now set the teeth and stretch the nostril wide hard hold the breath and bend up every spirit to his full height on on you noblest english End of chapter 5Chapter 6 of News from No Man's Land by James Green. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 6 The God of Battles. Lord God of hosts, whose mighty hand dominion holds on sea and land, in peace and war thy will we see, shaping the larger liberty. Nations may rise and nations fall, thy changeless purpose rules them all john oxenham everything is in the melting pot even our ideas of religion are changing the development of theology is being hastened by the big push and orthodoxy is being tested in the red crucible of war there is a lot of confusion and that all the contending nations claim god is embarrassing to us but not to god we may be sure that there is no jostling or confusion in the eternal mind the good shepherd knows his own and is not deceived by our claims and counterclaims gott mit uns is engraved upon the belt of each german soldier and the kaiser claims god as the german god 
he has been appealed to by the austrian emperor by the czar even the sultan's soldiers advance to the charge crying allah allah we appeal to god too it is all natural and from the human standpoint right we may be sure that the god of battles knows the worth of all our claims knows how much of truth is contained in our cause in his name the conscientious objector declines to fight and god only knows where conscience ends and cowardice begins the lord is a man of war and if history shows anything it shows that god does not despise the sword as an instrument whereby men contend for the faith and even the blood of men is not too precious to spill for the defence of the ideals of freedom and right like the pulsator on the diamond fields of kimberley war the mill of god throbs back and forth we may throw on it the heaps of earth but as it throbs it will shake away the clods and wash away the mire the true diamonds will remain to the superficial war seems to be a grim contradiction of the fact that god is the ruler of the world to them it seems as though this world were governed by a demon but really war is a terrible confirmation of god's presence in the world and a lurid re-emphasis of his inevitable and inexorable law the mental disease of selfishness lust of power and military glory was present it was slumbering in the heart of the nations in times of peace the disease which shows itself in commercial competition too broke out in the violent inflammation and eruption of war war is a delirium a delusion and a degeneracy it is made possible by the brute strength of a soulless people on the one part and the weak unpreparedness of an easy-going prosperous and pleasure-loving people on the other part suddenly a bolt from the blue fuses all antagonisms into the mad storm which we call war a good deal of dross will be burnt up but the pure gold will remain out of the collision of national ideals which are right or wrong heroism and self-sacrifice are born out of the commotion of contending ideals truth single-eyed in clear perspective and circular containing every point of view in its comprehensiveness will emerge it is not to the balance of power or the interrelation of dynastic connections that we must look for peace but to the balance of the naked truth and the essential solidarity and brotherhood of man the concert of europe has broken down in discord the conductor is rapping out with his baton the true music of humanity and he insists that we shall all recognize the keynote the pre-millenarian sees in it all a superhuman interference with the human will which is the prelude to a forcible application of the divine will and a millennium of peace and perfection but when we investigate we see that there is no mental violence in the coming of the great war we are reaping what we sowed it arises out of logical and adequate causes it will not end until these causes have been removed political excrescences must be sloughed off nations will be born or reborn in a day so war is working the world fever out of our blood cleansing our hearts and making us seriously face life's issues to get to particulars we hear much about manpower today it is the last word of the strategist the first thought of the statesman and the secret of victory but who bothered about manpower a few years ago a russian peasant in petrograd after the revolution said to an english press correspondent we shall have fine times in the church now there will not be so many long prayers for the czar the imperial family and all the nobility with a little prayer for the poor peasants at the tail end yet it is the great mass of men which russia possesses which forms the famous steam-roller upon which so many have placed their hope for the liberation of europe it may be that the god of battles has ordained that in saving russia and in part europe the russian people are to save themselves how was it with us 
how many cubic feet of air have our men had to breathe in the wretched and monotonous tenements in which they were compelled to live houses must be built that way i am told because the land is dear who made the land dear and men cheap men in many callings could not obtain a living wage some weird economic law supply and demand or other phrase made it impossible to give the worker more but suddenly a struggle for national life is thrust upon us and there is money enough i know it is a very complicated question but it is there we must face it we are our brother's keepers they are like sheep without a shepherd unless they are cared for it is a national obligation to provide right conditions of life proper education for mind and body for the boy who is going to be the unit in the manpower of the nation we must organize our national life to allow of this for we have no right to permit our industrial development to outpace our humanitarian provision of the fair conditions of a full-orbed manly life each nation contending is up against it men are precious in france but scarce the birth rate has fallen off why we leave it to french patriots to solve and turn to our own affairs once more we have suffered in this war and victory has been delayed because we lacked organization and yet we prided ourselves upon being organizers the victories in war are manufactured in days of peace we were not organized in pre-war days things happened under the pressure of war we have had to organize ourselves in many ways the railways have been brought under central control to serve england and not companies merely the vested interest of the drink traffic has had to be squeezed into more reasonable proportions and may have to go altogether to secure victory men and women are being mobilized for national service and agitation for women's suffrage is silenced for the present in the silence it may be that we shall learn that the claim for suffrage depends not upon being but upon doing national service is surely a good claim for suffrage representation should not merely depend upon taxation but upon a wider qualification service for the common good in war and peace we are not the only people under pressure of war and compelled to listen to the will of the god of battles we have seen an anglo-saxon nation claimed to be the freest in the world struggling to grasp at the same time peace and conserve its liberty reluctant to grasp the sword even to protect its nationals led by a far-seeing cautious and astute president it made a wonderful attempt to keep out of war but the grim circles of battle have with ever widening sweep reached this huge nation of peace lovers and it is learning that in citizenship quantity is not everything quality racial purity counts for something moreover nations are not permitted any more than individuals by the god of battles to evade or shirk the great moral issues of life once to every man and nation comes the moment to decide in the strife of truth with falsehood for the good or evil side the church is being tested by war it had not been prepared by its human leaders for this test though history shows clearly war revolution crisis and persecution are the foster mothers of religion but we built up the church for peace and prosperity its ordinances ceremonials customs and solemn pomps its appeal apparel and ambition all needed peace for their opportunity and prosperity for their support when a nation strips for war however it needs a religion from which everything which is extraneous and superfluous is eliminated when the soldier living in the world of elemental passions and away from all the church aids and props free from the suggestiveness of the church as a sacred place and all the sensuous accessories and aids to worship asks for religion he wants it neat he needs the fundamental the essential the irreducible minimum 
Now the church has to work in an altogether different atmosphere. It must not be thought that it is an atmosphere less favorable to religion. The drama of the soul never has so fitting a setting as in the red landscape of war, with its alternations of lively death and deadly life. The very processes of soul growth and the problems of time and eternity are, so to speak, filmed. A lifetime is compressed into a campaign. As the individual soul has its tragic opportunities, so the church itself has its great chance. Never was such a setting for the divine drama since it was first enacted. Never were the truths of religion so clearly illustrated, or the comforts of religion so pathetically needed. The suitability of the gospel message as a response to man's needs, and the perfection of Christ as man's comrade and saviour, never shine forth so fully as in the lurid glare of war's terrible perspective. It is the business of the soldier's preacher to interpret this. He has abundant mental material to hand, and he works in an atmosphere, solemn, insistent, and impressive. If he turns aside to talk of lesser things, he wastes his time. He must not get between the men and God, or put the church, or its ordinances, or its rules, so far as they are human, between the men and God. If this is so, when we speak of the church in the larger sense, how much more is it so when we speak of the church as a denomination, and all churches are denominations when we are at war? The minister, too, has to cut his baggage down. His spiritual equipment is in his mind and heart. The soldier does not inquire what college his padre comes from, or what qualifications the titles before or after his name stand for. Whether he is a bishop, a great evangelist, or a popular preacher means little to the man. What the man asks is, what sort of a chap is he? How is he sticking it? What has he got to say? Does he help a fellow? The chaplain's one object is to lead men in thought and faith to God, as God is revealed in Christ, and to get him there quickly. In regard to the church as an institution, there is a feeling among the men, more or less articulate, that it has humbugged them. It has denounced the sins it does not often commit, but has been too silent about the sins which are common to its own membership. The church, in time of peace, has built up a vast superstructure of respectability. The sins of the flesh and drunkenness and swearing were not respectable but it has not turned the white burning light of truth against the sins of the spirit, covetousness, selfishness, lying, fraud, greed, and injustice. The soldier has many things to put up with, but for the time he is freed from the soul-destroying influence of an industrial system built upon the basis of competition. He is not afraid of losing his job, and he need not toady to any one to secure the chance of his bread and butter. Under the pressure of campaigning, he begins to exalt comradeship and self-sacrifice to the first place in the list of virtues. Battle forges a new and strong bond of brotherhood. He does not possess this at first. He comes out of a world of self-seeking, but he gradually discovers that men depend on each other, in a word, the shells that fly, knocking the parapets about, and the rough and tumble of campaigning, knock a man's creed about fearfully. He has to resort his ideas of religion and the church, and when he puts them together again, he finds that they fit his complex needs better when they are built up the other way. Perhaps an arrangement of topics which I have found to be dead topics, as far as work amongst soldiers is concerned, and others which seem to be live topics, will help to show what I mean. Dead Topics Future Punishment, Baptismal Regeneration, Apostolic Succession, Claims of the Church, Sabbath Observance, Observances of Holy Days and Church Ordinances, Sectarianism, and All Church Shibboleths live topics personal salvation prayer and providence comradeship and communion christ as friend and lord righteousness god as a ruler 
here hereafter and the soul's destiny the soldier is particularly interested in spiritual biography and very glad to hear about what god did for paul peter moses joshua and david there are vestiges of superstition lingering in many men and it is hard to see where superstition ends and faith begins i have known men sample all sorts of religion during the campaign trying to find out perhaps what different chaplains have to say about things there is a species of fatalism they value luck and would sympathize with the prayer book phrase good luck in the name of the lord it is strange that men should turn to the elements of religion in which the church is getting slack they value prayer and i think most of them pray in their own way they believe in providence but do not expect that prayer for them means necessarily immunity from wounds or death but they know quite well that whatever may be their lot they will be the better for the prayers which ascend for them and for their own prayers an australian of the real primitive sort was moving across no man's land to the attack on fronelles and he stopped amid the hail of bullets and bursting shells and leaned on his rifle a comrade rushed up and inquired what is the matter mate are you hit hit no he shouted if you want to know what i'm doing i'll tell you i'm saying a prayer with that he seized his rifle and went forward to the charge an australian non-com who went right through gallipoli and was in many a fight wrote to me and said that since a certain service at mina camp in egypt he had made prayer the habit of his life and it helped him to play the game i have never gone over the bags without prayer first and specially commending myself to god and i find it bucks me up a lot another referring to an address on the text thy rod and thy staff comfort me wrote the note of guidance and strengthening helped me a great deal in the hard business of the attack on the lone pine and it was constantly with me in the gallipoli days while so many in pulpit and pew have ceased to ponder and wonder at the mystery of the atonement soldiers have seen a new meaning in it a man in our force at anzac said to me i never could understand before but now when i know i may be blown out i reckon there isn't much chance for me unless somebody has made up for my failure and done for me what i have not been able to do for myself i guess that is what it means he did not express it very well but agreed with me when i said that calvary has made up for our failure to come up to the standard of sinai that most difficult idea of substitution for us and representation of us in the death on the cross is forced into men's minds by many an illustration now to a soldier dying at etaples a chaplain said do you understand and does it help to know that christ died for you oh yes he said i know he died for me just as i am dying for those shirkers at home he used the word shirker without condemnation just as the first word which came to him and passed away at peace and content for so long the cross with its extended arms has spoken to the world of a redemption of love but we passed by carelessly not choosing to understand so that we might well ask of the multitude all ye that pass by to jesus draw nigh to you is it nothing that jesus should die now we know a little of what it means for so many of our best have died for us so many real if not material crosses have been lifted on the low hills of flanders so many have laid down their lives for the race that we are beginning to understand there is nothing morbid in these thoughts of christ dying the cross to the soldier is full of sweet helpfulness it appeals to him with comfort everard owen in a poem which we are allowed to reprint from the times called a kind hill to souls in jeopardy gives us the idea of tender succor which men see in calvary there is a hill in england green fields and a school i know where the balls fly fast in summer and the whispering elm trees grow a little hill a deer hill and the playing fields below 
there is a hill in flanders heaped with a thousand slain where the shells fly night and noontide and the ghost that died in vain a little hill a hard hill to the souls that died in pain there is a hill in jewry three crosses pierce the sky on the midmost he is dying to save all those who die a little hill a kind hill to souls in jeopardy what will the church do with the men when the god of battles gives the remnant back to us we shall have to make room for them they will want a simple and strong religion something to call forth and use the heroic in them they will not stay in the church if there is nothing doing for they are intensely practical to recapitulate the war has shown the political unimportance of the churches in europe the will of god was not expressed clearly enough or sufficiently by them to prevent the war the world was stronger than the church and imposed its will upon the church now that we are at war the churches are still divided in their witness for righteousness even the church which beyond all others calls itself catholic is not catholic in the sense of unity for it speaks with different voices in austria belgium germany and france the church which calls itself orthodox has failed to give the people a lead in russia with us the lack of unity in the christian church has weakened its testimony in the nation and marred its work in the army once more therefore in the history of the world the king of righteousness who is also the prince of peace is recalled in human life as the god of battles still he will make the wrath of men to serve him and he will gird the soldier to execute his purposes unconsciously it may be as he girded and used cyrus the persian i girded thee though thou hast not known me isaiah forty five five in spite of the failure of the churches he is setting up his kingdom of brotherhood and righteousness in the earth mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the lord he is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored he hath loosed the fatal lightning of his terrible swift sword his truth is marching on he has sounded out the trumpet that shall never call retreat he is sifting out the hearts of men before his judgment seat o oh, be swift my soul to answer him be jubilant my feet our god is marching on i have seen him in the watchfires of a hundred circling camps they have builded him an altar in the evening dews and damps i can read his righteous sentence by the dim and flaring lamps his day is marching on in the beauty of the lilies christ was born across the sea with a glory in his bosom which transfigures you and me as he died to make men holy let us live to make men free while god is marching on end of chapter six Chapters 7 and 8 of News from No Man's Land by James Green. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 7. The Chimney Pots of London. I will not cease from mental fight, or let the sword sleep in my hand, till we have built Jerusalem in England's green and pleasant land. Blake there is some very fine architecture in london and buildings which reveal some of the finest workmanship in the world for the london craftsmen are famous but all this is crowned with the craziest collection of chimney pots sometimes the brickwork of the chimneys is built from one angle to another above the roof like a zigzag and then surmounted on the same building with chimney pots of different designs and heights pointing two in different directions and again capped with many weird contrivances to make them draw they are certainly out of drawing as any artist will confess there are machines that whirl in the wind and by their mad circling withdraw the smoke and there are cowls that move with the wind swinging in such a direction that the wind cannot blow down the chimney there are hoods and ten monstrosities that rear their ugliness over palaces 
and there are chimneys that have been built up so much higher than the original ending that in their fresh start to the sky they spoil the sky view as well as the contour of the building there are beautiful chimneys which begin well but have to be assisted to do their work by horrible tin extensions soaring into the air these hideous makeshifts disfigure the dwellings of the rich and the poor alike with a deadly equality of utility unrelieved by any beauty to see it all stretching out beneath you from the monument fills you with disappointment at the wretched discord i believe there are experts in chimneys in london men who doctor them if one could be found with an artistic soul who could make them beautiful he would deserve well of his country but it would never do to take all these ugly things down for uniformity and even beauty may cost too much a house full of smoke would added to the london fog be intolerable handsome is as handsome does the housewife says ours is a beautiful chimney it draws so well when you sit by the bright fire on a winter's night you do not think of the ugly chimney aloft except as a plain-featured but dear friend but for all that these chimney-pots of london are a sad commentary on our human nature our architecture and building goes wrong just where it comes into contact with rough nature with its treacherous tempest and veering winds the architect plans a beautiful gothic mansion and everything goes right it is a dream a vision of harmony until he comes to the chimneys then brief and tragic experience demands a distorted chimney or a tin contrivance and the plan is spoiled so we build our lives up to a point it is to be a gothic career for the noble son what eton harrow rugby oxford or cambridge can do for him is done the church the army society with a big s lend a hand and he is turned out true to sample the right accent the right dress the right manner but alas when he comes into contact with the intricate promptings of nature and the subtle temptings of the world some strain inherited from the days of the conqueror makes him wobble he marries the wrong woman or doesn't marry her at all misses the bus or catches the wrong one his career is altogether different from plan and specification and yet he may be quite a good sort here is another case we set out to build a really artistic life she the favoured creature is nurtured amid culture and reared in the atmosphere of poetry listening to smart conversation in epigram and lightning sketch style she goes out into the world without a practical notion and because these things require money drifts into a business-like marriage with an unpoetic person who makes glue or blue settles down a queen and villa with marianne chimneys these are mild cases how few of us live up to our fond parents hopes and prayers how many of us end far otherwise than our education advantages and associations seem to promise we have power of choice we are not made uniform and we do wobble a lot when we are turned loose among the currents and storms of life we overseas britons are apt to expect too much of dear old london at first we are foolish enough to think that this mighty capital of our far-flung empire should be an epitome of all our british virtues coming to the fountain-head we expect the water to be pure we soon learn that it is not a fountain-head of anything it is a great bay of human life and action into which a thousand rivers of different quality and force empty themselves london is a magnified expression of the life of the whole empire the currents which we on the frontiers of the empire set going all come pulsing towards this mighty mother of cities but with the boundless generosity of a mother of nations mature but still vigorous she receives this inflowing life and sends it back again in responsive floods to the end of the earth 
the jaundiced critic treads this mighty city with the blinded eyes of ignorance and seeing faults and sins identifies her as babylon the great mother of harlots but to those who look for goodness london suggests the city of which it is written and the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it and the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honour into it let us not hide the truth from ourselves these chimney-pots of london for all their ugliness means a lot of kindly comfort they draw well they are comfortable to live with you may find the worst in london but you will always find the best also there is a warm sympathy for sorrow a motherly helpfulness in need a maternal solicitude for the welfare of the humblest which stretches down from the throne and is reflected in the kindness of the poor towards each other no good movement will ever lack support here and no stauncher friend to freedom is planted foursquare upon this earth than the city of london which so gallantly fought for its own freedom and so jealously guards it still if all these classic characters planned by fond parents had materialized right up to the very chimney-pots they would probably have been less companionable and kindly purity of style does not always mean domestic harmony go into these houses with the distorted chimneys and you will find them all beautiful within carrying an atmosphere of peace and well-being which is refreshing to the soul think too of how many of them have been turned into hospitals for our wounded soldiers and of others which dispense a hospitality to the men from overseas which helps them to forget or at least to bear their exile it is unreasonable to expect the discourse and decisions of the great mother of parliaments to match the classic purity of the building in which it meets its members are men swayed by many winds of interest and influence and if they wobble a bit it is only natural we youngsters would settle the irish question and the problem of the drink traffic monopoly very quickly we would fix up the suffrage for them and bring everything up to date very soon we would indeed until we get the oversea mail and are reminded of our own lesser problems unsolved and see our own wobbling if we have nicer chimneys it is because our climate is more kindly and if life seems easier with us it is because we are so young we did not have so much ory feudalism to dig up neither however have we such golden traditions and such a storied history our life is free but is it so full let us be very charitable to the homely chimney-pots of london we have poured out our treasure and blood for the empire in this great war gladly but this one city has sent over a million of her sons to fight and given readily scores of millions of her wealth without a murmur and is still giving out giving out without stint it is the most heroic adventurous city in the world where men use big maps think in millions and build nationhood not for today only but for the centuries to come to speak of lesser things where is there a more orderly a more good-tempered crowd than the crowd of london paris has its gay beauty edinburgh its classic lines but here they have dug parks out of the quarries of bricks and mortar the trees squares little green patches breathing spaces unexpected quiet nooks all these are a surprise to us because they have cost so much and they represent a city of ideals which embrace the past as well as the future later on when we are older and wiser you will call us to your council chambers and we shall bring something with us of the freedom of the large spaces some vaulting ambitions from new countries where life is a young man's adventure some clearness of vision brought from the solitary places we shall bring home some of the sweeping perspective of a land of magnificent distances freighted too we shall be with that love for england which only those can feel who have left her shores behind to strike the long trail of empire 
but we can never bring back such gifts to the mother country as she first dowered us with when she sent us out to the great new lands with a love for freedom which she nourished through the centuries with her own blood ah london of the lazy chimney-pots what we like about you specially is your marvellous courage london afraid shrinking timorous only madmen would think it how you wrestled with your mighty problems problems of transport you plant mighty railway systems in your heart and dig ways underground for your people and problems of administration greater than those of many nations but your courage is still challenged you will not fail us great mother of cities we look to you for a lead you are going to root out your slum public houses you are going to do more for the housing of your people and in the larger sphere of the politics of the world you are still going to hold aloft the banner of freedom and righteousness send out your life-blood of brave endeavour and we shall feel every heart-beat and respond to it away under the southern cross and wherever the union jack flies or english is spoken End of chapter seven chapter eight of news from no man's land by james green this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eight horse ferry road hail to the brave who going come no more the imperious call broke out their slumbering souls and woke to action all their manhood strong and bade them go that right might conquer wrong hail to the brave who going come no more hail to the brave who going come again though our poor vision may not see their form yet in the silent hour when thought seems deep we hail them near and holy vigil keep with all the brave who going come again j williams butcher when the great war is over there are some places which will live in the minds of the australians mena and the desert around the pyramids has become a part of the perspective of many australian lives it is stamped there by many a long route march and the training of the australian forces there is a page in the annals of the history of egypt which includes so much that is military most noteworthy being the assembling training and fighting of napoleon's army at the same place we had our battle of the pyramids strenuous enough if only a sham battle heliopolis with its old associations the city of the sun in the days of joseph and the place of his marriage was the centre for our new zealand troops and also for many of our australian units particularly will it be remembered by the thousands of sick and wounded who came there to our great number one australian general hospital which occupied the largest hotel in the world the heliopolis palace the classic island of lemnos both before our landing at gallipoli and after our evacuation loomed large in our life salisbury plain with its ancient towns and its druidical remains at stonehenge also come into the picture but horse ferry road has its special place in our records thousands of australians on business bent visit headquarters there and the number who report there on duty or leave every week never falls below four figures they see that it is a college and that the officers are working in libraries surrounded by memorial busts and bronzes of old masters tutors and scholars they see hundreds of clerks working in lecture halls classrooms or college chapel it will be interesting for them to know that horse ferry road is worthy of coming into the historic perspective of the australian army to begin with it is probably the oldest road in england certainly older than watling street the archbishop's horse ferry began when his grace was more powerful than any of the several kings in england and brought the traffic from one side of the thames to the other before bridges were thought of the horse ferry road carried this ancient traffic and was laid out by use very much the same as a parmamata road followed the tracks of the bullock teams along the ridge leading from sydney to parramatta 
and thus became in a casual way the first road in the history of the new nation under the southern cross the ancient archbishop never could in his wildest dreams foreshadow the time when hosts of british soldiers from the other side of the world would march along his narrow horse ferry road the building occupied by our headquarters is the westminster training college for teachers whose principal is dr workman a leading scholar of england and one of the first authorities on medieval history it was first thought of taking the college for an officer's training depot but the war office ultimately handed it over to the australian commonwealth the australian imperial force but continues the war record of this great college of its eight hundred or more pre-war students who have attested seven hundred and thirty five are on active service forty seven have been killed in action twenty three wounded seven reported missing and three are prisoners of war it has contributed ninety seven commissioned officers and two hundred and eighteen non-commissioned officers to the army the men of this college have obtained many distinctions in the field lieutenant william f forshaw and lieutenant donald simpson bell have won the v c the first case is well known to australians for lieutenant forshaw won his v c in the critical days of gallipoli by holding up turks for forty-one hours by throwing bombs captain c h hill roberts and captain j w wood won the military cross and lieutenant e j phillips the distinguished conduct medal and the medaille militaire private herbert brindle and gunner w l cooper b a have won the military medal this does not profess to be a complete record of the honors won by westminster training college men but just a list dug out of the statistics while the war continues to show that the australians have become citizens of no mean city in coming to horse ferry road westminster besides this war work the westminster college has done a great deal for britain in sending one of its old tutors dr lowry to the munition board he is a great chemist and the author of some of the surprise packets which have been sent to fritz in the shape of new explosives in peace as well as war the college which was founded over seventy years ago at horse ferry road has gained honourable distinction hedley fitton the famous etcher was one of its old pupils sir james yoxall author and member of parliament is another old student james smetham the famous artist and letter writer was a tutor here john scott grandfather of the rev dr scott lidget was the first principal and was followed by dr ridd the great educational expert and writer on methodism and anglican theology besides that it is linked to australia by the fact that some of its old pupils have gone to occupy honourable positions as teachers and in some cases ministers in the commonwealth at least one of our great australian schoolmasters mr f chapel m a bachelor of science principal of the largest boys college in australia prince alfred's college adelaide was a student and a member of the staff here one of the strange things that war does is to bring back in khaki men from australia on business to the a i f headquarters to find that it is their own old college men from westminster training college are fighting in france palestine mesopotamia on the salonica front and some of them are in naval work and while this famous alma mater sends out her own sons to the frontiers of the empire she opens wide her hospitable portals to receive the brawny pioneers of new lands way down under thus men from back block townships in australia are brought into a sort of fellowship of service with the english trainers of the old horse ferry road training college our men will think kindly too of horse ferry road because the war chest club just opposite the headquarters was so often their home here under the hostess mrs samuel a capable group of lady workers have dispensed thousands of hot meals to sore-footed and war-weary australians on leave from france 
then there was the quiet refuge of the y m c a hostel on the other side of the road in the wesleyan central hall where under the lady superintendent mrs workman and her voluntary assistants similar good work was done to horse ferry road the australian came gladly leaving it regretfully for war again and when the war is over it will be a kindly memory in close proximity to westminster abbey and the houses of parliament where so many bonds of empire are forged the old westminster training college will continue to do its useful part in empire building end of chapter eight end of news from no man's land by james green